Her. Uh, hey, Margaret, Tish. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brent, and thank you for hosting us. Um, so as Brent mentioned, I'm, I'm Margaret. I lead our data operations, which is a mix of analytics, engineering, and uh, integrations. And I'm joined by Ratish, um, who's going to be patient with me as I ask him to click through the slides, um, who leads our data science algorithms at Quartet. Uh, so today we're here to discuss the approach that we took at Quartet in scaling how we're connecting patients to mental health care providers, or MHPs for short. Um, you're going to hear that acronym quite a lot in this presentation, so just want to make sure everyone's acquainted with that. Um, I'm, I'm going to walk through our data flow and some key concepts uh, relating to healthcare data that uh, will show how complex this area is. And then I'm gonna pass it over to Ratish for the main event, who's going to walk through our algorithmic approach in matching patients to MHPs, and also how that has evolved over time in those bullet points you see under matching. Um, so as Brent mentioned earlier, this is a uh, free form. So please feel free to just come off mute and um, ask questions as, as they come up. Um, you can go to the next slide. All right, so before we jump into it, I wanted to give a, some background context on Quartet. Uh, Quartet is a mental health technology and services company that helps patients get to the right mental health care across the US. And we do this by outreaching to people that either we've identified as in need of care or their primary care physician has identified them as in need to care and we match them to an MHP. Um, so this care coordination is managed through our web application where primary care providers can refer their patients to a mental health care provider uh, who is onboarded onto our platform. Uh, I'm sure for anyone on this call that has tried to get access to mental health care, you've experienced firsthand how difficult it really is to get an appointment scheduled with an MHP, let alone a timely appointment with an MHP. And one of the major reasons for this is that providers are overwhelmed with need and simply don't have the availability to take on more patients. And that's something that problem space is really what we looked to optimize at each step of the way using machine learning. Or you can go to the next slide. All right, so each of uh, these three sections on the right represent how machine learning is leveraged um, within the patient journey at Quartet. So it really all starts with linkage, uh, which is when a patient gets referred to Quartet. When a patient is seeking care or has been referred to Quartet for care, we need to confirm who they are or confirm their identity. Um, the reason why we do this is that we don't just to confirm that we don't already have records on that patient or duplicate records, but also to provide additional information on them uh, that's needed to refer them to care. So for example, their membership information with the insurance that they're enrolled in. Um, so I'm sure everyone on this call has encountered an annoying issue when you walk into a doctor's office and you provide your insurance card every time, even though you probably already submitted that information. Um, this is also annoying for your doctors <laughs> to let you know um, they have to consistently verify that they accept your insurance. Um, so this, this is a identity problem that something Quartet deals with with thousands of patients. And given the sensitivity of the data that we're working with, it's, it's really essential that we get identity and the information that we're sharing with providers correct. And that's why we developed the linkage algorithm that uh, matches entities across data sources. And here on, on the slide, you'll see what those data sources are. Um, we get insurance enrollment data from our partners. Um, we also get information from the patient as part of their request and information from their providers um, when they have put in a referral. So the next step is really on the treatment request. We need to take into account uh, if the patient has particular needs. Um, when they are requesting care. And we handle this with, uh, with an algorithm. So this is important um, in order for the patient to get the type of care that they're looking for, but also so that their provider understands their needs. Um, each provider, you know, uh, there's 
a lot of specialties in healthcare and each healthcare provider typically specializes in a very specific area um, or, or treating a specific condition. And we need to take that into account when we refer them to a, a mental health provider. And we do this by parsing clinical notes um, from the provider with natural language processing to see if there's additional treatment needs as well as history on the provider. And last but certainly not least, which is the main event for this talk is Smart Match, where this all comes together. Um, so we need to match patients to the right MHP, and that is our Smart Match algorithm. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide. All right. So with Smart Match, uh, we're using data on the healthcare provider's history and the patient preferences. So again, just marrying those two concepts together. And Smart Match ranks provider matches objectively using this information, which is great uh, conceptually because it reduces, you know, subjective selection if a provider um, were doing this themselves or manually doing it. But um, in most instances of healthcare, this process is really complicated for, for both the patient and the provider. Oftentimes, um, as I mentioned before, providers have very specific specializations in treating certain types of conditions, and it just might not be what that patient is looking for. Um, additionally, providers are part of many different contracting agreements that you'll see here under the concept of network with insurance companies. And, and those networks determine if they're able to be reimbursed for a service that, that they're providing. Um, and that really matters to the patient because if they're not in network, the patient would have to pay out of pocket for the full service. On top of that, um, as I mentioned before, there really is an incredibly high demand for mental health services. And each provider can only take on so many patients into their panel. So these are all really core con healthcare concepts that this algorithm addresses. Um, Smart Match addresses all of these complexity complexities um, by training daily on the provider's history, including their scheduling history and the patient's preferences. And it really does this while optimizing for the provider's ability to take on more patients and accept referrals. Um, so I'm gonna pass it to Ratish now, who's gonna walk through how we optimize the algorithm to address these complexities. Uh, thanks, Margaret. Hello, everyone, I'm Ratish. Um, okay, um, so on the last slide, uh, Margaret walked us through the final production version of Smart Match. Uh, something that took us years to get to. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about the evolution of the algorithm, what the first solutions were, different ideas we considered and tried, uh, what worked uh, and what did not work and how we arrived at the solution we have today. So first let's look at the problem of matching patients to providers. Here is a patient, Sarah Smith. She needs treatment for anxiety and depression with focus on treating trauma. Uh, here are three providers that are eligible to treat the patient. Uh, they accept the insurance, they meet their needs, and are within commuting distance of the patient. So how do we rank them? Uh, uh, first, before we get into the providers here, uh, it is important to note that the success of a provider on our platform depends on how engaged they are with us. They treat patients outside of Quartet as well, so a provider could be a great provider in general, but be disengaged with Quartet, and vice versa. Okay, so the first provider, Alexandra. Uh, has a high success rate uh, on Quartex platform. Uh, success rate here is defined as the percentage of patients that they successfully scheduled an appointment with uh, out of the ones that we send them. Uh, so the first provider has a success rate of 45%, which is pretty high for our platform and mental health care in general. Uh, and we have sent them 300 patients overall. Uh, so they are kind of well-established uh, on our platform. The second provider here has a success rate of 33% measured only over six patients. Uh, and so they have shown good potential, but we uh, do we really know if they are better or worse than the first provider? Uh, can we say for sure with only six patients that the success rate is truly 33%? Probably not. And the last one, Molly Wilson, um, has a success rate of 0%, uh, but that's only on a single patient referral. Maybe she's the best provider ever in the history of mental health care, but we don't know that yet. Um, so who do you send this uh, patient to? Uh, do you wait and see if Molly is a good provider or do you go with the tried and tested Alexandra uh, or the in-between James? 
And this type of problem is called a multi-armed banded problem. Um, <laughs> the picture of the dog here has nothing to do with multi-armed bandits. Uh, it is Molly Wilson's dog, um, who's a coworker here. And she asked me to put the picture here in exchange for promoting the stock at Quartet. So if you notice more attendance than usual, it's probably because of the picture of the star. <laughs> um, okay, so multi-arm bandits, um, explore or exploit. So multi-arm bandit is a problem formulating the classic explore exploit dilemma. Uh, in this example, you are looking to go out for dinner and wondering if you should go to your usual place, um, a, a usual place that you love or try out a new place uh, if you always try new places, you will lose out on enjoying good food because not all places are great, at least not for you. Uh, if you always go to the same place, you might miss out on finding that great place that is probably better than the one you usually go to. Um, and this is a common explorer expert dilemma you face a daily in, um, in your daily life. Uh, now, why is it called a multi-armed bandit? Because it imagines a bandit with multiple arms sitting in front of multiple slot machines trying to figure out which is the best machine. Each slot machine has a probability of generating a reward that is unknown to this bandit. Uh, the reward could be anything like $5 and the reward probability could be something like say 70%, which means the machine gives out $5 70% of the time. Um, I know that's unrealistic. That's too good a slot machine, uh, just an example. Uh, band the, now the bandit wants to find the machine that has the highest chance of winning the reward in the long run. Um, and now law of large numbers uh, states that if the bandit tries enough times, um, they can figure out the true reward probability of each machine. Uh, and you can figure out the best machine. So, uh, but when you find the best machine, would you regret playing the others? Uh, and can you define this regret? And the reason I'm using the word regret is because it is a standard term used in multi arm banded problems. It is defined as, as you can see here, the total reward of the best machine minus uh, the total reward the bandit received by playing the way it did. And there are many ways to play, um, play this game. Um, and, uh, but the goal is to find a strategy that minimizes the regret. So it is not just about finding the optimal machine. It is about finding the optimal machine optimally. And so you want your goal is to minimize regret. Now, here are some applications of multi arm banded problems. I'm sure a lot of you on the call already know about this, already probably use multi arm bandits. Um, and I'm using an acronym MAB here for multi arm bandit for the rest of the presentation. Okay. Uh, so um, one of the most common applications is A B testing. Uh, where instead of waiting for the test to finish and determine the winner, the algorithm automatically decides which version of the site should be shown more often than the other. Um, and I think I read a blog post by StitchFix which said multi-arm bandits were used in A-B testing at StitchFix and Thompson sampling in particular. So I'm sure most of you know about this. Uh, some other applications are recommender systems, uh, for example, showing movies on Netflix, uh, which um, for the data scientists in the room, collaborative filtering works well, uh, which um, tries to figure out um, which users are similar to a given user and try to use their, the things that they like to, for recommendation on a very high level. Um, so why do we need multi-arm bandits? Uh, because what happens when a new movie is introduced and you, wanna, and you don't have enough data on it? So how do you explore it? And how much do you explore it? And is there a strategy that will give you an optimal solution? Okay, so similarly, um, other applications are dynamic pricing, ad placement, and there are many others uh, that you can imagine. Um, so enough background about multi-arm bandits. Let's uh, see what we did at Quartet. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. Um, um, let's look at it one by one. This is the first solution we implemented for Smart Match, um, and it's treating um, the matching problem as a multi arm banded problem and an implementation using Thompson sampling. Uh, the graph on the right shows probability distributions for two providers. I use the term providers and MSPs interchangeably. MSP just stands for mental health provider. Um, so these providers have a true reward probability of 0.7 and 0.5, uh, but we don't know that. 
And that's what we want to figure out by playing the machines or by sending patients to these providers. Uh, the blue one um, has a, is better, and by better, I mean has a higher scheduling rate, uh, again, which we don't know of um, um, compared to the green one. And the question is, how do you, what is the strategy that you are going to use to send patients to both of them and fig, to figure out who the best machine is while minimizing the regret, regret that we defined earlier? Okay, on the left is some math. Um, uh, that describes how these distributions are created. Um, for the data scientists in the room, you probably have already seen this, uh, but I'll just take some time here to explain it in detail uh, for those who don't know. Uh, so Thomson sampling uses beta distributions, which um, allow us to easily model the probability of success, uh, in this case of a provider, uh, based on the successes and failures seen so far. Uh, and the success for a provider in our case is a successfully scheduled appointment for a patient that we sent to them. Um, a and B are parameters. Um, they denote the number of successful, uh, number of successes and failures. Um, and this equation right here gives us the probability of success. Um, the more data we have, uh, that is higher values of A and B, the narrower the distribution is. And by narrower, I mean, if you see here, the blue um, distribution is narrower than the green one, which means we become more and more confident about this. Um, this, the constants one and three uh, encode uh, the chance of success for in the absence of data. So uh, this means there's a 25% chance of success to a new MHP. We kind of came up with it um, in an ad hoc way, but we like to say it was empirically. Um, <laughs> where it was more random than not. Um, and lastly, the average of this distribution is this, which is the expected value of this distribution. And if you pay attention, it is, it is basically the same as the scheduling rate of the MHP. So in the long run, what you're really modeling is the total number of patients we, we sent to an MHP and out of those, how many were scheduled by the MHP. Um, okay, so enough about this. So how does Thompson sampling work? So it does two things. It creates distributions based on the success and failures of each MHP using this. And then it samples from these distributions and picks the MHP with the highest number. What is the number? It's this, right? Like for example, if I was sampling from these two distributions, uh, I'm trying to pick a point here. And I'm more likely, if you see, uh, the blue one is more likely to have a higher number. So it helps the better MHPs are on, will, are hopefully in the long run are going to be on the right side of this plot. So let's see what's happening here. The top left graph is the beginning. We tried one MHP, the blue one, and it was a success. You see its shape is a little bit better than the green one, which means the distribution is nicer. Um, and why is the shape important? And the placement of the distribution is important because we are sampling points from it. And we pick the point that's higher, and we pick the MHP belong, sorry, corresponding to the point that's higher. Um, and distributions tell us which points are more likely to get picked. Oh, sorry. So the second graph here is after 10 trials. So at this point, we've sent 10 patient referrals. Uh, we can see that the green MHP is leading, even though it's not the best out of the two. Uh, and by best, again, I mean the one with the higher scheduling rate. Uh, but that's just, as you know, it's just randomness. We don't have enough data yet, and the green one is leading. But as you, you see slowly, as we send more patient referrals, the distributions become narrower and narrower, and uh, we become more confident on who's the best provider. And slowly, the blue one um, kind of is in, gets in the lead and also becomes more and more confident. And you can see the last plot. If I were to sample a point from these distributions here, the higher value is way more likely to be from the blue provider. So at this point, we almost know that the blue one is a good one. And Thompson sampling here has some theoretical guarantees. It's nice because uh, it kind of shows uh, that this strategy, um, this algorithm um, has um, gives an optimal solution, uh, at least asymptotically. Okay, one last thing to note here that there's a big assumption here that MHPs have an inherent scheduling rate, that their success can be modeled by a Bernoulli distribution. This assumption, even if true at any given point in time, is not really true at all times. 
uh, at the minimum, all MHPs success uh, changes over time, something that is referred to as non-stationary. Um, the way we solve for it is by using a sliding window. Um, and so we just, at any point in time, to compute the success and failure of a, of a provider, we use a sliding window. Okay, all said and done. I know this was a lot, um, but we implemented this and let's see how it did in production. Okay. So uh, firstly, it was it's super easy to implement. The code is less than 15 lines um, and it's easy to, it's not that easy to explain, uh, but still um, depends on who you're explaining it to. Uh, but there were some challenges that we found. Um, Firstly, multi arm banded problems try to optimize exploration. And we realize that's not really needed here. Like providers are not like ad advertisements that work on do or don't work. Our goal is to engage and use all MHPs, all providers, and have them work with us long term for years. Uh, and we benefit from having providers from for years on the, on the platform. And we want to empower them to do well. Uh, so we didn't, so it, weirdly, we are incentive. I, on the contrary, we are, we are incentivized to explore them a lot in the beginning. Um, so the whole idea of regret that, uh, that explores optimally is a little bit not applicable in this case. Uh, the biggest one is it ignores contextual information. Two years of matching data from patients. We, we have a lot of data. We have been sending patients out to different providers. Uh, and they have been responding over time. We know how they interact with our patients, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, um, and as long as the referrals are concerned. Uh, and then there is not much control over routing because there is randomness. And Thompson sampling explores using randomness, and that's not very desirable as a property in an algorithm. Um, and one huge problem that we started facing once this was went live. Um, is many providers started complaining about receiving more referrals than they could handle. And at the same time, some providers wanted more referrals than they were receiving, which was a problem. And like, if, like when we, in the support channel, when I got like a complaint, there is no way to feel like, oh, this is Thompson sampling with its randomness will figure out how to send you referrals and how not to. So it was a trouble like for us to give people a chance to specify um, or like to control how, how many referrals they are getting. And lastly, finding the best MHP is not the goal. And everything we've been talking about with multi arm bandits is about the narrowing down to the best machine. Okay, so with that, enough criticism about Thompson sampling. We considered some other multi arm bandits. Uh, we went through the literature um, and considered a few other algorithms. There are tons and tons of types of multi arm bandits, huge um, um, research that has gone into it. Uh, but these uh, four uh, are broad categories are the ones that are applicable to us. Um, the most basic ones solve for the stochastic MAB problem where your rewards are independent and identically distributed. There were many algorithms we considered like um, be greedy, explore, then commit, Thompson sampling, upper confidence bound. Uh, the second one is contextual. Uh, as we have been saying, uh, the, um, our implementation ignores context, and there is a lot of literature around uh, contextual bandits, which take context into account. Uh, I have links to the papers at the end of the deck. Um, some uh, popular solutions are uh, lin linear uh, UCB and EXP4. I'm not going to uh, go discuss them here, uh, but you can read the papers that I'm, uh, I have linked in the presentation. Uh, the third one is budgeted bandits. And this is kind of relevant to us because um, uh, I was just talking about constraints um, because MHPs were saying they want a maximum and a minimum volume of, of patients. Um, so we tried them, but uh, in the end, uh, we didn't really use them because we could. We found that some other solution worked better uh, that I'm going to discuss in the remainder of the presentation. And non-stationary, that's the last one, which is reward distributions change over time. Um, this, there are sliding window, UCB algorithms, and sometimes you can just introduce context to make them stationary. 
Okay, so enough about multi-arm bandits. We kind of moved away from it a little bit and started, there are a couple of improvements that we made on our end. Um, so firstly, we trained a supervised model, which was trained on two years of patient and provider data. And uh, we added a probability calibration. Um, and what this did was essentially for an incoming patient, it basically gave us a matching score, which was um, the likelihood of, um, which is a true probability of success. Um, model, this model had about 250,000 patient provider matches uh, across over hundred features created from patient preferences and provider history. Nothing really novel there, just your standard XGBoost model. Um, but what was nice about this is it, it gave us a true probability of, it gave us a probability of score for success which uh, we tested it online and it had a high correlation with, with the true probability. Okay, secondly, uh, we made changes to the product. Since I said MSPs were complaining about referral volume, we made a couple of product enhancements and uh, we basically asked them to indicate their maximum capacity over a two week window. And we also allowed them to specify if they wanted more referrals. Uh, we initially were a bit wary of adoption uh, but we were surprised that most MSPs um, and our liaisons were pretty responsive about indicating the volume preference. And this was a game changer because now we did not have to worry about estimating their capacity based on the declines. And we could just use the capacity indicated in the product as a constraint in our algorithms. Okay, so now with these improvements, let's see how we designed the solution we have in production today. Okay, so the classifier gives the probability of success for sending a patient to a provider. And in this example, we see a table of patients versus providers and the probability score listed for each one of them. Uh, for example, 0.65 is the probability of sending patient one to MHP two. Uh, the product improvements indicate the maximum and minimum volume capacity for patients. So let's say the MH, that MHP1 can only take two patients out of these four. So which two patients would you send to it? Um, since these are raw probability scores, adding them up will give you the total number of expected appointments, uh, estimated of course. So in this case, uh, they add up to make two expected appointments. And if I change this up, I get the different numbers. So in this case, these four add up to 2.65, still MSP1 getting two referrals, 2.25 and three, which is the best strategy uh, in which P third and fourth patient go to MSP1, first good goes to second, uh, second MSP and second goes to third MSP. Now, as you can see, uh, this um, is, a problem where we want to maximize the number of appointments while, um, while honoring some constraints. So how do you train an algorithm to do this? Uh, the answer is quite standard. It's binary optimization. Um, most of you know, probably, this, it's an algorithm used uh, commonly in operations research, such as warehouses, to optimize shipment routing based on cost and inventory constraints. And I think based on stretch fix uh, blog posts, I can see that it is used here um, as well extensively, at least I saw in a couple of places. Okay, so let's formulate this problem. Um, so um, binary optimization, um, here you can see, um, this is the score matrix that you saw, and this is the assignment matrix. And assignment essentially means um, patient one here is assigned to MHP2. Um, and some definitions, SIJ is the score, uh, A is the assignment, and Q and P for J, which is the each MHP, indicates the maximum and minimum patients that uh, the MHP can handle. And so these, uh, so binary optimization, it's like a classic uh, combinatorial optimization problem. Uh, where the decisions are binary. And we try to minimize or maximize an objective function given some constraints. Uh, there are standard implementations that take your specification of objective and constraints and find you an optimal solution or not, depending on the problem and the implementation. Um, okay, some constraints here, maximize 
the appointments. Uh, MHP should not get more than the maximum patient limit that they have indicated. MHP should, should get more than the minimum patient limit that they have indicated. And the last constraint is um, each patient is sent to exactly one MHP. And with this, you can just send this to a traditional solver and it will give you a solution. And for our problem, it's not that easy to find a solution um, in a couple of minutes. Um, but if this was the talk, I wouldn't be speaking because binary optimization is pretty standard. It should, I, it should have worked, but the problem is we cannot use it directly. And why? Because Quartet's product does not support batch patient referrals, not yet. Every patient is sent to the MHP one by one in real time as soon as it arrives. And that poses a problem here because we cannot batch them together to run the optimizer and do assignments. So we have to think about something else, something. And the question is, can we translate binary optimization into something that is more conducive to real time? And that brings us to the next and the last um, piece of our talk, which is adjustments. Okay, so um, we came up with this idea of a score adjustment, which is a parameter of an MHP at a given time. Uh, it is the amount of adjustment we need to make to their probability score to make sure they satisfy the volume constraints while optimizing the expected number of appointments. So for each MHP, we just add this adjustment to the probability score and we pick the MHP with the highest adjusted score. And it's simple. Um, so it's just greedy after, but after the adjustment. Intuitively, this means that if the MHP is overdrafting, you penalize it and the adjustment is negative. If it is underdrafting, which I know is not a word, uh, but if it's underdrafting, boost it, which means the adjustment is positive. Um, and this score adjustment can be learned from data and is easy to explain and interpret. Uh, in the plot here, you can see there are two MHPs, green and blue. Um, and that's, yeah. You can see the score distribution on both of them. Uh, and just looking at the plot, it is clear that the green one will get more referrals than the blue one, since it is more likely to have higher scores. But if I slightly adjust it, let's say in this case, the green one is getting more referrals than it wants and we want to reduce the number of referrals. Um, so if I slightly adjust it to the left, uh, as you can see in the plot below, uh, the blue one will get some of the referrals that the green one was originally getting. Um, and the question is, how do we learn how much to adjust each MHP by since they are dependent on each other? Um, if one MHP gets more referrals, someone else wouldn't. And the other question is, which, um, is not in this presentation is, is there a one-to-one -one relationship between assignments and adjustments? Are we losing any optimality when we move from assignments to adjustments? And I will kind of tend to it uh, in the end, but let's look at adjustments first. Okay, so how do we get from assignments to adjustments? It's kind of simple. Uh, we start with the same constraints that we had before, and we just add one more constraint. And this constraint is basically just says um, that assignment should happen to the MHP with the highest score after adjustment. So it's again, greedy. You implement, you add adjustment and then you send it to the highest one. And that's all this new constraint does. But what it makes to the assignment is those decision variables are not really um, searched for anymore. What you're actually searching for is are these adjustments. Okay, so far so good. There's one last hurdle before we get to the actual results. This is quadratic. And what that means is, um, is this is, these are linear optimizers, which means we won't be able to feed them to like a standard solution. But gladly, uh, there is a trick to convert quadratic to linear when one variable is binary. And we applied that trick uh, it's straightforward, it's on the slide, and I'm going to let send the slides around. So I'm not going to uh, get into it right now, but you can read up on it. It's um, very easy to implement, and we implemented it. And okay, so, um, and now, without further ado, the results, and first the simulations, and then production results. Okay, so we ran a simul 
we implemented this, everything that we had so far, adjustments, um, and we ran a simulation to see how it performs. The simulation was on eight MSPs across 500 referrals, and we, each one of them has a different score distribution, as you can see here. Um, the score, the, these parameters identify the score distributions. Some of them have higher um, mean than others. These are the score means. So if someone has a score mean of 0.6, which means that MHP is more, more likely to get referrals than this one. And let's take an example. Uh, MHP2 has a mean of 0.5 and a high standard deviation as well, which is kind of higher than some of the others. We said it, we need to limit its capacity between zero and 20. This is the minimum capacity, this is the maximum capacity. And in our simulation, uh, based on a greedy method, which means the MHP with the highest score gets the patient, these are the number of referrals it would have gotten. So it only wants between zero and 20, but it was it would get, it's getting 113 referrals. And we want to bring this number down to under 20, and we will do that with a negative adjustment. So the linear optimizer uh, puts, sends these referrals, the score matrix and the other things through the optimizer and learns these adjustments. Let's see. Uh, so in the, naively, if we did not have adjustments, five out of these eight MHPs are over or under drafted. Uh, like this MHP should have been between 35 and 75, but it was getting 115 ref patient referrals. Now, after adjustments, it is just um, under the limit. The reason it's not 75 and 76, it's because of tiebreaker issues. Uh, okay, and these are the adjustments that we learn. And the idea is we take these adjustments and try them on unseen data. Now, this is going to overfit a little bit uh, because it's, it, is, it will overfit to the data. Uh, we bootstrapped it. We ran it a uh, hundred times to see how stable the adjustments are. And for MSP2, you see uh, the adjustment is negative 0.37. And it's kind of stable when I run it on a bootstrap. Uh, they, it varies mostly from like 0.36 um, to like 0.42. Uh, so it's kind of stable. We use the, me, uh, we use the median uh, for our simulations, sorry, for our testing which is the next slide. So to try these learned adjustments, we are trying it on unseen data and we introduce some noise to the distributions. Um, now we again drew 500 referrals from the same distributions of MHPs, uh, but with added noise. Minimum and maximum capacities, of course the same. Uh, they were still overdrafting or underdrafting because, well, it's the same distribution. And this time, uh, we use the adjustments from the other run and applied them here. And one, other than one of them, almost every single, uh, sorry, four out of five are correct, are within the specified range or almost within the specified range. So for example, MHP4 uh, would have gotten 114 patients, but after the adjustment of negative 2.21, uh, it has under 75, which is the limit. Um, okay, so, so far so good. Um, there's one MHP here, which was, which was supposed to be between 30 and 60. Uh, naturally, it would have gotten 17 and now it gets 26. But this is a little bit interesting here that the, we didn't really have any adjustment for them. Then why did the patient count increase from 17 to 26, uh, which is quite close to the minimum limit of 30. And the reason is because the MHPs are dependent on each other. Um, and what that means is when you penalize the other MHPs, this MHP is likely to get those referrals. Uh, and that's exactly what happened here. And in the training, uh, the, uh, in the, uh, the model basically said that it does not need any adjustment, but because it is going to get those referrals naturally when we penalize others, but well, it did not. Ritish, I got uh, two questions for you. Yes. Um, so uh, one, um, I, it seems like there should be a relationship. They're probably the same thing between the um, uh, these corrections are and the um, uh, uh, constants of the um, Lagrange optimization. The uh, oh, I'm missing the word. 
um, binary optimization, but yeah, it could yeah. be. Uh, uh, yeah, the Lagrange the multiplier. Um, they uh, Have you taken the data that you fed one at a time through your adjustments to get the R and compared it to what the lambdas would have been under the binary optimization, or are they the same? Yeah, that's a great question. They are the same, exactly the same. And so there is a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence uh, between the two. And that's a great question because I wondered for it. And I was like, I can demonstrate that it's the same, um, um, like in my mind. And yeah, I'm yeah. theoretically, curious. it feels like they should be. Yeah. yeah. And I ran them um, through uh, the simulator many times. Initially, I was surprised that how every single time, uh, across I think a thousand simulations, I could find a one-to-one -one co uh, correlation. Like it's a funny thing, like a, a month ago, like I was thinking when, not a month, a couple of weeks ago when I was making this presentation, I was like, you know what? I think I can come up with a proof for the bijection between those two. And so I tried, but then I, yeah, I realized I'm not, as mathematically gifted as I think I'd like to be. We're all out of practice. <laughs> so all I have is a bunch of pretty plots and a smile for you all. <laughs> um, and then I, I have a second question, which is, um, so when you're feeding these through and you're like simulated data, uh, presumably you assume like, okay, I have a thousand patients that are gonna come through in the next two weeks. Um, is that well known in Quartet? You know exactly what your demand for patients is going to be. And if not, can you comment a little bit about how that affects the performance of, of your um, optimization in the presence of noisy total demand? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that was like, I thought about solving that problem first, because the right way to do this is to, by predicting demand and like using that demand in your um, um, in your binary optimization formulation um, instead of learning the weights and then applying them in the future. Because uh, obviously I'm assuming there's a huge assumption here that the demand stays constant, uh, not just the demand, the distribution of the demand, the distribution of the referrals coming in kind of stays the same week over week. Um, so I, um, I initially thought that I would forecast demand and use that. But then when I tried it in production, I I realized I don't need to. The, the adjustments were a little bit stable week over week uh, when I computed them. Um, and what that basically meant was that I could use them in production. So if I had run it on a sliding window and the adjustments were different, um, that would have meant that, that my assumption isn't true. But I did not really find that in my simulations on real data. Um, and so I just went along with this instead of demand forecasting. Yeah, I guess a uh, follow up then. I wonder if there's a, um, I wonder if if there's if there's a connection uh, where you would get somewhat the same result or possibly the same result if you took the last two weeks demand and used that as your forecast for the next two weeks demand and then ran uh, um, the binary optimization um, routine like straight. Uh, if you get lambdas from that that are equivalent to your Rs. You are right, but the lambdas are still going to be like a fixed matrix. Um, and, you know, I, I am a little bit confused because overall the distributions will be the same, but not the actual values. So for a given referral, I don't know what the scores are going to be. Right. Um, so, I, I understand what you're saying, but the actual problem is what what I can what I can predict is the mean is going to be the same and like the distribution is going to be the same, but the lambdas require the actual value to be nearly the same, which I I don't know how strong that assumption is. Yeah. Great questions. Um, I'm almost done, so we can uh, there'll be more time for questions. Okay. Okay, so we compared it to Greedy and uh, Greedy is just sending out referrals to the MHP with the highest score and stop once you max out and do ignore the minimums, do nothing to honor them, which helps the Greedy algorithm because then it doesn't have to take away from its good referrals, good matches. Um, so I compared uh, this to Greedy 
Uh, and the plot here is, I define regret, but it's not the regret from, it's not the standard definition of regret. It's the maximum number of appointments if there were no constraints. So maximum possible number of appointments um, and minus the actual reward. And this is the red one is greedy and the black one is the linear optimizer. Um, and the LP solution is clearly has a lower regret consistently. Um, the x-axis here is congestion, which is I just keep on in introducing more providers into the network. And you can see the regret just on an absolute sense also reduces as you increase the congestion because you know the, there are more MHPs to take on the referrals that are taken away, that are being taken away because of the constraints. So yeah, so this was a simulation to show that the LP beats greedy uh, in the expected appointments, because here we just showed that the constraints are being met. There was nothing about the objective function. And this shows that the objective function is also better. So this, like as far as the simulation goes, that these two things together uh, kind of demonstrate uh, that the LP solution um, is catching on a signal here. Okay, so final slide. Um, this is what we have in production. Um, the supervised model, a probability calibrator, and an LP score adjustment, adjust, uh, adjustments. Uh, we compute this every night from utilization data of past two weeks. It's implemented in Pulp, um, and which is an open source library. And when for an incoming patient, it sends uh, it sends uh, an incoming patient to the MHP with the highest adjusted score. Uh, it easily switches between batch and real time routing requests. Right now, we only right now we only have real time, but for like backlog and things like those, we might have batch requests in the future. Uh, it explores new MHPs aggressively, which is nice for a platform because you want to give a high chance to new MHPs. It has resulted in a reduction in MHP complaints and reduction in our overdraft and underdraft error. And this is slightly unrelated to this, but our algorithm consistently beats uh, humans in A-B tests. Uh, but that's more about the supervised model and less of a testament of the score adjustments. And that's it. Here are some references. A lot of them are uh, on uh, multi arm bandits, which is a very interesting field to read up on. I would strongly recommend this book. Um, uh, it's available online for free um, and it's on banded algorithms, uh, really covers the theory well. And also a book on measure theory by Terence Tao, if anybody's interested. And here are some of the papers on the bandits that we, uh, we I briefly touched upon. And that is all. Uh, thank you all for listening. And thank you, Brent and everybody else for um, hosting us. Um, and I see some familiar names and faces from Quartet uh, who are here to support us. So thank you all. Big shout out to you. Okay, that's all. And now I look- We have a couple minutes left before two, although I know we tried to end a little early, um, but I'm happy to stay until the end of the hour if anyone has any further questions. Quiet group today. All right, well, um, I guess with that, uh, thanks both of you for um, for joining us today. I found it a, a super interesting talk. Um, learned a lot about the connections between multi-arm bandits and linear programming, which you're right, we use both uh, pretty aggressively here at Stitch Fix. Um, and I have a couple uh, questions to sort of pose to colleagues as a result. So um, yeah, thanks again for the talk. Um, uh, Cheers for now. Thank you so much.